Hello and welcome to the Better Building Summit. Thank you all for arriving on time to, uh, I believe, one of the first sessions, uh, maybe the first session taking place uh, as part of our uh, summit this week. So thank you all for joining. Um, we have a jam-packed agenda for us today. So we will just jump into it first with some housekeeping. Um, so we can hop into the next slide. So uh, in case you are in the right or wrong place, uh, you are in the Workforce Accelerator Meetup uh, as part of the Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit for 2021. Um, this session will take place uh, from 1 p.m. Eastern time to 2.30 p.m. Um, and although this is kind of centered on the Better Buildings Workforce Accelerator partners, um, uh, of course, everybody and anybody who is on the line is welcome to be here and listen and hear more about uh, the workforce development activities and efforts that DOE has going on as part of the Better Buildings program. Uh, before we dive in, there's just a few housekeeping points to cover. Um, so first, please note that today's session will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. We will follow up when today's recording and slides are made available. Uh, next, as an attendee, you are in listen-only mode, meaning that your microphone is muted. If you experience any audio or visual issues at any time throughout today's session, please send a message in your chat window. Uh, located at the bottom of your Zoom panel. There should be a little button that says chat and you can open it up. Um, we can hop to the next slide. So my name is Madeline Salzman. I work for the U.S. Department of Energy in the Building Technologies Office. Um, I manage the Better Buildings Workforce Accelerator as well as our workforce development portfolio of research projects. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, next slide. Really quickly here, you can see our agenda for the session. Uh, we're mostly through the introductions and housekeeping. Then I want to give a really quick presentation just about the Better Buildings Workforce Accelerator um, for folks who may not be familiar and talk a little bit about our year in review. Um, uh, the bulk of the presentation today will be featuring our guest speakers um, who are uh, Better Building Workforce Accelerator partners who are doing a great, uh, great work to support uh, the building efficiency workforce. Um, and then we will wrap up with some Q&A at the end. So please keep in mind of questions that you have for our speakers as they are talking and we will try to get to them. Next slide. We are using a tool called Slido. Um, so if you've been involved with the Better Buildings programs before, you've probably used this already. You can either go to slido.com or there's also an app for your phone you might have. And if you just enter the code DOE, um, you should be able to enter for the session. Um, and we will be using Slido for Q&A, polling, and session feedback. Um, so once you enter the code DOE, there will be a drop-down menu and you want to select Workforce Accelerator Meetup. And that will be uh, how you will access the poll questions that will start on the next slide. So please bring up Slido. Um, and it will also be the platform where you can submit questions to our speakers um, and or any comments that you have during the session. Also feedback at the end of, uh, end of the session. Um, so I will give folks a moment to bring it up and we can go to the next slide where we have information about our first poll. It's always a good thing for me to try to do it at the same time so I know actually how long it takes. <laughs> okay, so the first polling question, oh, we're starting to get some responses, uh, is what sector are you from? Hopefully a fairly straightforward one. So far, the bulk is Nonprofits. Then we have contractors or service providers. Got some federal government flows.
All right, I'm officially submitted as a federal government person. So I know folks have had time to do it. <laughs> um, I know probably a few more folks are still getting set up, but we, I think, can go to uh, the next poll, just in the interest of time. And so just generally, what workforce topics or challenges most interest you? Um, I think it says enter a word, so this should auto-populate as some type of like word cloud setup. Funding, all right. Energy jobs. I think you can also enter another word after two. Oh, you've got one. Got electrification, job description, diversity, union, increasing talent pipeline. Career path. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> this is going to get harder. Awesome. Really good stuff. I think a lot of things that we'll be covering uh, throughout this presentation. Um, and it's good to see what topics are most interesting to folks. Career path. Ooh, all of a sudden, that one's taken over. <laughs> Equity. Great. All right. Well, I think with that, well, as I said, please use continue to use Slido um, to use the Q&A function, and there will be feedback at the end as well. But I do want to jump into a few slides that just give background information about the Workforce Accelerator. So we can go to the next slide. So for those who may not be familiar, we launched the Better Building Workforce Accelerator uh, this past fall. Um, as an effort to work with uh, industry and uh, workforce development stakeholders across the country on how we can improve the presence of energy efficiency content into existing workforce pathways and also uh, better bring new people into these careers and um, put people on a trajectory from education and training to entry level jobs to long term career development. Um, so we have a number of partners that we work with to develop uh, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goals that pertain to these areas. And then we work with them with um, group discussions, uh, technical assistance, uh, amplified success stories, et cetera, to help make these things come to reality. Next slide. So uh, we started this program as one of our many efforts going on to address existing workforce challenges. Um, as we saw on the previous slide, we bucket these challenges into three major categories. One is many people are not aware of the career opportunities in the space, or if they are, they might not know um, much about them or necessarily have a positive perspective. So we wanna help change that. Um, next, even if they are interested, there might be confusing pathways. They don't know how to get involved, what education and training they need um, to do good work. And finally, even if they've done all of that, they've figured it out, uh, the maze of getting into this career sector, uh, there are still poor quality installation issues. So they still need to understand more about the newest technologies to do this work well. And we are working across these areas. Next slide. So those challenges are what inform our strategies uh, focused on building interest in these careers, uh, showcasing them as welcoming, impactful, and rewarding, streamlining pathways. So career paths came up on the word cloud. Um, we'll talk more about that. And then improving skills by updating continuing education and increasing use of digital tools. Next slide. So uh, this, I, I apologize for the small font, but I'll say it's, uh, for me, exciting that we have so many participating partners, uh, about 40 partners that have joined us from across city and state governments and governmental associations, trade associations and unions, colleges and universities, and nonprofits and small businesses to uh, support these efforts and, and push their own programs forward. Next slide. Some highlights, so the commitments that these folks have made amount to developing 16 new workforce programs. Um, 16 partners are targeting underrepresented communities in this workforce specifically, producing over 130 resources, 
training 38,000 participants, distributing 20,000 surveys to better understand uh, the current marketplace and what the gaps are, and then reaching over 450,000 people with workforce information. So really excited about uh, how all this adds up. Next slide. And then I just wanted to give a shout out on the first six months or so of uh, progress that has been made. Um, I don't want to read through all of these, but do want to give a shout to our many partners, even if they are not featured on this slide or the next slide. Um, on the work that they're doing. IMT has launched their Building Innovation Hub. Building Performance Association has a new website for um, training and careers. Uh, EBA offers over 84 online trainings. Roxbury Community College, who you'll be hearing from, launched its new uh, certified building automation technician. You can go to the next slide. Oh, I'm gonna read through them, here we are. <laughs> uh, IREC developed a new a green building career map, um, which hits on that career pathways question. The core network has convened an energy efficiency workforce development community of learning. Uh, the city of Milwaukee utilized technical assistance to engage underrepresented communities in their uh, region. And the US Green building, building Council created a new green building career site as well. So uh, there's plenty more than just these highlights, but it's been very exciting working with these folks on, on launching these new resources. Uh, next slide. So with that, uh, hopefully that's given you a little flavor for what we've been focusing on as an accelerator, but I wanna turn it right over to our speakers. So uh, our speakers are Mary Ellen Sprinkle from the Core Network, Adele Ferranti from NYSERDA, and Frank from Roxbury Community College. Um, up first, we have Mary Ellen Sprinkle, who's been a longtime champion for youth and national service. Mary Ellen came to the Core Network in March uh, 2008 as Director of Government Relations and became the President and CEO in 2012. Um, and she's focused on uh, service and conservation core work to, uh, to recognition among lawmakers and policymakers throughout uh, the federal government. So Mary Ellen, without further ado, thank you so much for presenting today and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you for in inviting me. Um, so as, as Maddie pointed out, my name is Mary Ellen Sprinkle. I'm um, the president and CEO of the Core Network. The Core Network is the National Association of um, Service and Conservation Corps. We are based here in Washington, DC. Um, and actually, if you could go to the next slide, um, I will start by explaining what a Service and Conservation Corps is. Um, so in, um, in, a, in a model and philosophy sort of reminiscent of the Civilian Conservation Corps of the 1930s, which was established by then uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to employ a lot of um, uh, then unemployed young men during the Great Depression to do a lot of infrastructure and conservation projects across the country. Today's corps um, engage young people usually between the ages of 16 and 25 and returning veterans up to age 35 in conservation service projects that are um, designed to um, improve environmental stewardship, um, mitigate climate change, um, make community improvements, um, and, uh, and, and better the environment and, and communities. Today's cores are um, operated by nonprofits and state and local governments across the country. And they engage in um, project work that is usually sponsored by federal, state, or local um, projects part, uh, partners. And, um, and they are usually through public-private partnerships done through um, either MOUs or cooperative agreements and today's cores, today we co uh, collectively engage about almost 140 cores across the country that operate in every state and the district and the territories and collectively engage um, between 20 and 25,000 young people a year. And if you could go to the next slide. So the core network, as I mentioned, is the National Association. Um, we were founded in 1985 by what was only a handful of course then who wanted a voice in Washington and to be able to influence um, policy at the federal level. What we do is 
today is advocacy, obviously, um, provide technical assistance and provide access to project and grant funding opportunities, standardized programming. We have an accreditation program to make sure that um, cores are operating um, up to a, um, a high level of standards, both for their project partners and also for the young people that they serve. Um, we provide um, resources and best practices around work readiness. We have a, um, a national um, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative that we are implementing across our programs to help um, particularly young people of color um, excel in the conservation space and, and have the tools and resources necessary to do that. And we build partnerships like this one with um, the Better Building Initiative, the DOE. Um, we have a partnership with the Department of Transportation, the Corporation for National and Community Service that allows our cores to access funding streams, resources, and job opportunities in those spaces. Next slide, please. So cores look very different depending on the, the community they are located in, the project partners that they, um, they work with, and the core members that they engage. Core members are, um, are very diverse and can um, actually core members, um, about 50% of our core members are identify as young people of color, 46% identify as female, and, um, and more than 30% uh, come from uh, low income socioeconomic status um, or education level. So depending on the young people in the program, um, cores offer a lot of common elements. All cores offer a paid service learning or work experience. So all core members are somehow compensated for the time um, and effort they put into the program. They work under the supervision of trained crew leaders and staff um, who not only teach trade skills, but also help develop work readiness, like showing up on time, um, and uh, team building and communications and conflict resolution. Um, there's an intensive um, orientation or training period where core members um, learn everything about the tools they'll need, the safety that they'll need to um, adhere to, as well as some of those work readiness skills I just mentioned. Individual core members are often um, provided the benefit of um, individual career interest assessments, skill assessments, and, um, and career counseling. And then workforce development and leadership development based on sort of their needs and, and desires. Uh, and uh, a number of cores are also provided with um, transition support into jobs and follow-up services to help them uh, retain those jobs. Next slide, please. So core members gain um, job training skills. And again, those are soft and hard skills. They get hands-on work experience. They get to interact with project sponsors. They need to get to actually develop the skills and do the work. Um, they get a stipend or living allowance. A number of cores run charter schools or engage GED programming to help young people um, complete high school. If that is a requirement, a lot of Ameri uh, core members get AmeriCorps members, uh, get AmeriCorps education awards that can pay for further training and education um, after graduation. And, um, and a lot of core members get access to wraparound services like career counseling, um, transportation, child care, and, and things like that. Um, next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the range of project work is diverse. Although all the projects are considered um, either natural resource management or conservation related, that can vary from planting trees to removing invasive species to fighting wildfire to installing solar panels, um, permeable surfaces, energy audits. Um, a number of cores uh, respond. Um, and provide disaster recovery assistance. In 2020 alone, which was a slow, um, a, a relatively slow year for the cores due to the pandemic, um, almost 30,000 uh, households were informed about energy efficiency policies and practices. 
uh, more than 2,600 energy audits were performed and more than 2,500 homes were weatherized. Next slide, please. So, so just for some examples, um, Mile High Youth Corps in Denver is an AmeriCorps program. They get education awards and um, stipends and living allowances through the Corps Network. The young people learn how to install energy and water saving retrofits in um, qualifying low income homes. They provide um, energy efficiency and conservation education to residents. And, um, and in 2020 alone, they um, conducted over 1200 energy audits and um, weatherizations. So the young people are learning how to program, uh, install program programmable thermostats, LED lighting, high efficiency toilets, low flow shower heads. Um, and they're also learning uh, um, construction skills. Next slide, please. The Sustainability Institute in Charleston, South Carolina um, is also an AmeriCorps program, particularly designed for young people who face multiple barriers to employment. Um, so they are afforded uh, additional assistance, um, support, and wraparound services. Um, through the program, low-income homeowners apply. Um, the supervisors go conduct the, um, the walkthroughs and the core members do the energy audits and, um, and do the upgrades. And they are able to earn industry-recognized credentials um, and gain skills that they can, um, that they can take directly into the, um, the workforce. Next slide, please. Conservation Corps Long Beach, another AmeriCorps program. Um, this is, works with a partnership through Grid Alternatives. And in last year alone, 14 Corps members received the, um, the PV installer certification. Next slide. And Civic Works right here close to home. They run a green, um, a green career development center, and they have a number of different kinds of programs, um, energy challenge program, an energy ready program, and a tiny houses program. And core members learn skills and get directly placed into jobs with the help of Baltimore Civic Works. Next slide. So um, a lot of work, um, a lot of work needs to be done in order to help us transition to a clean and sustainable economy. Um, infrastructure upgrades um, and thousands and maybe millions of workers need to be trained and retrained. Um, at the same time, there are millions of people who are in need of jobs. So this is a really ideal time, I think, for um, partnerships like the, the Better Building um, Initiative for us to come together and think about how we build career pathways and training programs to support those and um, an advancement for people of all stages in their career. Um, I am very encouraged President Biden recently or in the first week of his um, administration issued an executive order calling for a new civilian climate core, um, which envisions putting millions of people to work in the clean energy economy. Um, and we have been part of developing that initiative and um, and think that it provides a lot of opportunity. He also included in his um, in his budget request ten billion dollars for training and project work, um, and that we um, believe may be rolled into the infrastructure package that is currently being developed by Congress. So lots of good work already going on, um, lots and lots of opportunity, and we are very excited to partner with all of you to sort of figure out how. Course can serve as the entry point for young people, um, get some basic education and training, and then move with you all into the workforce. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, I actually have one quick question for you um, while we're, we're here. Uh, just curious if, if folks on the line are not sure if there is a core functioning in their area or if they want to you know learn more about what their core might be up to nearby what's the best way for them to look into that or should they reach out to you or somebody else they can reach out to me but they can also go to the www.corenetwork.org which is our website and we have a list of cores by state 
um, several, some states have as many as 14 or 15 cores operating. Um, so you can read about the individual cores and reach out directly to them, or you can, um, are certainly welcome to come through me. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, I got some background noise on my side. Uh, we can, I think uh, if folks have questions, as a reminder, please submit them into Slido uh, and then we can address those at the end. Um, and I'll be excited to do that. Um, but up next, we have Adele Ferranti from NYSERDA. Adele is the team lead for NYSERDA's uh, $108 million workforce development and training initiatives that target existing and emerging workers in all sectors. Um, this includes energy efficiency, electrification, building science, renewable energy, and emerging advanced technologies, as well as developing career pathways for veterans, disabled workers, dislocated workers, and low and moderate income residents. She was a senior project manager in NYSERDA's R&D group for 15 years where she started NYSERDA's photovoltaic and wind training program. Um, and with that, Adele, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we're very proud to be a part of the Workforce Accelerator. Uh, so thank you for inviting us. Uh, for those of, the, of you that don't know, NYSERDA is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority also known as ICERDA, and we promote energy efficiency and the use of renewable energy sources. Our efforts are really aimed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, accelerate economic growth, and reduce customer energy bills. Next slide, please. So again, just kind of looking at our programs from our mission through uh, deliverables, we're focusing again on advancing clean energy innovation and investments to combat climate change, to improve health, the health, re resiliency, and prosperity of New Yorkers, and make sure we're delivering benefits equitably to all. Our uh, investments really need to reach disadvantaged communities to the tune of 40%. 40% of our investments have to reach disadvantaged communities. So as I saw that the words that we were posted earlier with the challenges, uh, I'm excited because I think we're touching on all those words, career pathways, diversity, jobs, and I'll walk you through that in a second. As Maddie mentioned, we have $108 million budget for our workforce development and training initiatives. Uh, we have six unique funding opportunities or solicitations open right now, and that kind of represents our portfolio of funding opportunities. And we recently received some federal funding in a pay for success program that I'll mention briefly. NYSERDA doesn't train individuals. We support training organizations, whether it's community colleges, unions, community-based organizations, trade associations, manufacturers. And we're really trying to serve existing workers, new workers. We have train the trainer programs. We're really focused on priority populations or people with additional barriers to employment, as well as disadvantaged communities or environmental justice zones. To date, we've committed 30 million of our $108 million. We are on track to train about 32,000 individuals and that's direct and indirect. A lot of what we do is to develop sustainable programs. So that allows us to really make sure our investments continue over time. And we support businesses to hire work, workers through an on-the-job training program and for internships. And as you can see here, we've supported about 500,000 new hires through the, our on-the-job training program a quarter of which are priority populations. And we've helped 680 interns find jobs at 171 clean energy businesses. Next slide, please. So just so you have these references, these are our current funding opportunities. Uh, first come first serve in some cases or due date solicitations where we uh, support the training initiatives that I'm gonna talk about today. Next slide. So as I think about the programs across the portfolio, again, we're looking at advancing the skills of existing workers. For example, maybe we're working with HVAC contractors and we're teaching them about heat pumps. We're also focused on new workers, new entrants to the wor workforce. And I'll talk about some of those opportunities in a moment, whether it's career pathway opportunities or direct uh, support of existing programs that are training new workers, training trainers. And as I mentioned, we're focused on priority populations such as veterans, Native Americans, low-income individuals, 
fossil fuel power fossil fuel workers that are transitioning to clean energy jobs, previously incarcerated, homeless, single parents, and 16 to 24 year olds. And in that case, a lot of those 16 to 24 year olds are in programs like we just heard about, youth, youth build, job core programs, technical high schools. And also we're very focused on low income neighborhoods, environmental justice areas, and opportunity uh, zones in New York State. Again, trying to support those that have been really left out of the clean energy economy to date. Some of the technology areas that we are focusing on, HVAC, building operations and maintenance, building electrification, we saw that as one of the words earlier, areas of interest, both air source and geothermal heat pumps, insulation air sealing, high efficiency lighting, smart grid energy storage and offshore wind. These are all within our portfolio of workforce development and training initiatives. Next slide, please. And again, in general, we're really looking for training that addresses a specific business need or business needs of businesses and skill gaps. We're not gonna just train people and set them loose and hope they find a job. We're gonna invest in a training program. It's gotta be tied to business needs. The business has to be involved to provide internships, perhaps job interviews, perhaps their advisors for uh, the curriculum that's being developed. Some cases they're trainers. There's got to be a real business need, business connection. And as I mentioned earlier, we're looking for training that'll be sustainable. Ideally, it's integrated into a degree program or it's part of a certificate program. It's integrated into an apprenticeship program or a pre-apprenticeship program. We're looking to make sure our investments are sustained. Some of the additional uh, requirements for training existing workers, for example, there's gotta be a clear market gap. If there's already HVAC training in the market, we're not gonna fund it. If there's a gap, maybe it's a regional gap, a technology gap, we need to help update curriculum, then we're able to invest. And we always have to have a, a technical training focus. While career pathway training, as I'll mention in a minute, may have other training like soft skills training, professional skills training, all of our training does have to have a technical training element. And as we talked about, or we heard earlier, a lot of interesting career pathways. We've been supporting career pathway projects in New York for, I would say, seven, eight years at a minimum. We are really looking for high quality, comprehensive energy education combined with workforce preparation activities working in the field, internships, and training. We wanna make sure people have the professional, basic and technical skills they need to do really well in a job. For our funding for career pathways, at least 50% of those individuals trained have to be, come from a disadvantaged community or a priority population. We're making sure we hit our targets to hit those that haven't been served in the past. I mentioned we have to see partnerships with businesses, whether it's hands-on, training, on-the-job training, internships, pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships. Each project has to have a clear job placement goal for all trainees. In the case of our career pathway funding um, currently, we have to have at least 80% of those trained placed into an internship, apprenticeship, or job within six months of completing training. It could even be placed into advanced training. Perhaps they move on to a degree program or more advanced certificate program. Next slide, please. Just some of the areas that are uh, uh, eligible for funding. We support curriculum development, training trainers, delivering the training, building out training labs, which we know is important. Hands-on training is really critical. During COVID, of course, we saw a lot of training shift to online, but now it's shifting back in a safe way. We support testing and certification fees, job placement services, and as I mentioned, apprenticeship, internships, and job training. With career pathways, it's really important to fund wraparound services. We've paid for mentors, job coaches, transportation, metro cars. One project even has us supporting driver's education. We've got to be clever, we've got to be creative, and we need to be able to address those barriers to employment if we're going to be successful. Next slide, please. I mentioned uh, our federal funding award. I think we were the first a recipient of a CIPRA award from the Department of Treasury and Department of Labor. We're very excited about that. It's probably the first of its kind pay for performance program as it relates to clean energy training. We are um, 
in line to receive up to $7.1 million in potential outcome payments if our clean energy career pathway training projects are successful. If we can demonstrate that those trained in our programs receive a higher wage over time, we would be able to receive up to $7 million in outcome payments. So it's very exciting. We're planning on training about 660 low income individuals in career pathway programs over the next three years. Again, it, it's all the um, elements I mentioned before with job training, wraparound services, coaching, and um, we've got some exciting partners with MDRC, who is our evaluation contractor and social finance, who has helped us develop this program from the start. And TRC is our implementation contractor and they're supporting this project as well. Next slide. Just wanted to go over a quick, uh, some project highlights to kind of illustrate some of the uh, elements I mentioned on the previous slides. Next slide. This is an example of one of our on the job training partners. So here we're providing employers with wage subsidies to bring on new workers in clean energy jobs. They have to have a training plan. We really try to get those workers up to full productivity on the job as quickly as possible. And uh, Fred Collis is one great example where they really look differently at how they hired people. They look more closely at their past work experience, hobbies, to try to find people that would excel in new jobs. In the past, they were just focusing on experience and the responsibilities of the job, but they, the funding from NYSERDA allowed them to look at things a little bit differently. And even with the uh, pandemic, they hired 10 new employees and uh, in HVAC jobs, service technicians. So just an exciting example of an on-the-job training partner we've helped support in New York. Next slide. 32 BJ training fund, a good example of us working with the union uh, and they're working with manufact a manufacturer to provide training on HVAC and building management systems. They're training 600 union members. It's an 11 week course that fe features HVAC fundamentals, building management system basics. And they're really trying to develop a pipeline. We heard that earlier of workers in the HVAC. Oh, I see a typo there, sorry about that. And building trades. And just on the bottom of the slide, you see how many people have been trained to date. The project's still going on. So just a great example of us working with the unions. Next slide. Here we're working with uh, non-traditional employment for women, helping prepare women for construction jobs that incorporates green pr building practices. It's a, an exciting opportunity to expand their current uh, training to focus on clean energy. We provided funding for environmental literacy training, sustainability tra training, energy efficiency in construction, working with utilities like Con Ed, National Grid, and PSEG, and really trying to direct these trainees into 30, more than 30 registered apprenticeship programs. Next slide. Will Dan, this is another example, providing uh, young adults with training to become small commercial energy auditors a great opportunity for them to enter into a new field with partnerships with employers so that when they're trained in energy auditing, they're prepared for a job. So far we've trained 124 individuals, 61 for priority populations or disadvantaged communities and graduates have been placed in jobs already, uh, about 20. And uh, again, this project is just underway. Next slide. Stacks and Jewels, another great example of a uh, non-for-profit working with high school students in advanced lighting, heat pumps, building integration. They're working with UA Maker Academy, South Bronx Community Charter High School, and the Lower East Side Girls Club. They're teaching these students on computer programming, wireless networking, HVAC, uh, 118 trained to date, lot, 125, uh, four received uh, industry recognized cer certifications or they received that many certifications. We've seen paid internships and full-time placements already. Another project just underway. Next slide. I think this is the last example. It's uh, Youth Action Programs uh, and Homes. These are, this is a program designed to train people on building operations and maintenance to prepare youth in Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx for entry-level jobs in multifamily buildings. We're working with the CUNY Building Performance Lab, Association for Energy Affordability, 72 hours of classroom training, wraparound services. So far, 15 have been trained, 11 uh, job interviews have been completed. We've seen internships and new business partnerships as businesses offer internships.
So these are just some examples of the variety of projects that we're funding to support career pathways to focus on disadvantaged workers. Last slide, please. Uh, a lot more to go. I think at any given time, we have at least 70 training projects underway. And as you saw earlier, working with hundreds of businesses to hire new interns, uh, new staff with on-the-job training. So we're excited about what we're doing and we know we have a lot more work to do. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Adele. Uh, fantastic. I'm gonna do the same thing for you that I did with Mary Ellen. Um, I guess one, if people wanted to learn more about uh, the work that you're doing and projects that maybe are happening in New York, um, some of the ones that you mentioned, should they contact you or should they visit your website? What's kind of the best follow-up? Yeah, the best uh, first step would be our website, nyserta.ny.gov. There's some great information on our clean energy workforce development and training landing page. And if they have any questions, I'd be happy to follow up. Fantastic. And one other question, just obviously there's so much going on in New York. Um, thanks to a lot of the work that you guys are doing, you know, uh, also a lot of money kind of flowing through these areas. I'm curious what you think um, kind of things Department of Energy could or should be doing um, to support efforts like this, either in New York or in other states. What do you think would be most helpful coming from the federal government? Putting yeah. you on the spot. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. But something that comes up often is curriculum development, right? Every state should be running around developing curriculum on HVAC and heat pumps and uh, air, you know, air sealing, best practices. I think the federal government could help develop curriculum, different modules. It could be basic, advanced. It could be modules that are integrated into union programs. And I think the other area is training trainers. We keep hearing there are not enough trainers around. Identifying trainers, training trainers. So those are some quick examples. Awesome, thank you. And uh, I, I know there's some questions that have come into Slido so far, but just a reminder to enter those into Slido so that uh, we can get to those at the end of the time. Um, but our third speaker that I'd like to turn to is Frank Muruk from Roxbury Community College. I'm really excited to have Frank here. He's the Executive Director of Roxbury Community College's Center for Smart Building Technology. He's an architect, educator, technologist, and innovation strategist whose research explores the nature of smart buildings in the pursuit of carbon neutrality and performance optimization. Um, he spent 10 years working in investment management and has taught at uh, the School of Visual Arts, the Rhode Island School of Design, Roger Williams University, the Parsons School of Design, NYU, and the New York Institute of Technology, where he served as Associate Dean for the School of Architecture and Design and Chair of Master's Architecture Program. Thank you, Frank, for joining us today and excited to hear more about your current projects with Roxbury Community College. Thank you. Uh, next. Great. Uh, so I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, DOE and NREL because uh, in my, when I was at NYIT, we did two solar decathlons, which was a tremendous learning experience. And I still have many contacts with many of those students to, to date. Uh, many of them actually launched companies uh, from those efforts and they're still in operation today. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. The, the first effort we did was America's First Solar Hydrogen House which has got tons of press. And the second effort we did was called Open House, which got into controls a bit. So that's how my, my interest kind of led into controls. So, so zoom ahead. Um, uh, I'm sorry, can you go back? <laughs> so uh, some of the background, strategic and logic initiatives. We, you know, at the center, uh, we were formed about uh, just over a year ago. We launched in January of 2019. And we formed a board of uh, like we were. Our school was a was a um, getting a lot of attention because we had one of the biggest solar canopies in Boston. It was over a parking lot with 151 geothermal wells underneath it. So the community got together and they said a lot of industry got together and said this would be a, what we really need is a smart building technology technology center we can't find people in that realm it's taking months to commission buildings we that would be wonderful so we had a board we got together and we formed uh kind of uh four strategic initiatives or logic to form the program we wanted to be an aggregator of best-in-class energy efficiency programs 
because from our perspective, we don't want to reinvent the, the wheel. If we don't have to, we want to leverage what's out there. So, um, and energy efficiency is a big part of smart buildings, of course. Um, secondly, we want to be a producer of state-of-the-art BAS technicians. Uh, thirdly, we want to be a state, uh, we want to have a state-of-the-art lab and fourth stakeholder engagement. So we're going to go through those kind of slides in that order. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's a picture of the solar canopy. Once again, we were winning. Uh, our president has was winning awards for this effort. We're in Roxbury, uh, a neighborhood of Boston, which is one of the poorer neighborhoods. Uh, our student body is uh, over 91, 92, 93 percent people of color. I can't remember the percentage, but we're in a neighborhood that has so much potential because there's so much latency in the workforce. And a program like this, everyone just felt if, if it needs to be someplace, it needs to be a building into in a neighborhood like this. We have a lot of people came to me and voiced the opinion. We have no doubt that Boston can um, reach its carbon neutral goals in the financial district, but neighborhoods like this really need to help. Next slide. So once again, there's our my background with the solar hydrogen house and the open house and launch ahead. Uh, we, the, the germination of this idea kind of really came together on uh, April 16, 2019, when Senator Markey came to help us launch this uh, initiative. And someone else, we just heard before that uh, someone else is working on the Civilian Climate Board Core Bill. And we were working on that from the start. And he actually came last two Mondays ago to our school to launch that, uh, you know, with a big press conference to launch that initiative. And that's a really good uh, thing, I think, and it's totally aligned with our uh, goals and objectives. It's, you know, $1.5 million kind of initiative, and half of that money will go to communities of color, such as Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. These are all the areas where our students come from. Next slide. Oh, can you, uh, also, so we have this big, huge, uh, opening of the center in January of 2020. Uh, all our, we had a great advisory board of some 40 members. We had people like the utilities, Eversource, National Grid. We had universities like Harvard and Northeastern on the board. We had uh, consultants like Arup and uh, Skanska and uh, City of Boston. So we had a really good Boston Medical Center, real powerful kind of advisory board behind the center. We launched it with over a uh, uh, million dollars in grants, which we used to, to uh, create a lab. And the actual launch date was on uh, January 30th, 2020. Next slide. So with our advisory board, we put together a map of our strategy, uh, which I mentioned before. We wanted to be a best, an aggregator of best in class energy efficiency programs. What I hear and what our board hears so much is so, there's so much duplication. When I first came to Boston, I said, it seems to me like everyone's working on so many different parts of the same thing, and there's so much overlap. Does anyone have a map? And um, actually, everyone came back to me with almost the same response, saying, if you can do a map, give it to me, because you know there's so many people working on the same thing. So actually, we started working with some MIT students who put together a map. <laughs> We're working on a map of the ecosystem. So I think that's a big problem. And our perspective is uh, if someone's doing something that's that's best in class, we, we don't want to duplicate it. We want to offer the program here at the school. Secondly, we want to produce, be a preferred producer of state-of-the-art BAS technicians. We want to be a hub for community engagement, and we want to be a center for thought leadership. Next slide. So we want to be vertical and horizontally aligned. Vertically, we want to be aligned with what the city, the state, and the community and industry are doing. So, um, and horizontally, we wanna be aligned with what our institution is doing in community. So what our, what our school is doing is they're really, their mission is about engaging the community, uh, preparing the next generation of diverse leaders, establishing standards of excellence for all college operations, delivering high quality uh, support services and programs to students. So that's where this kind of intersection of these four uh, kind of objectives came from, this horizontal alignment and vertical alignment. So we came up with this mission, the RCC Center for Smart Building Technology prepares the highly skilled workforce needed to implement the sustainable high performance and energy efficient smart building practices 
required to achieve Boston's 2050 carbon neutral goal with a sense of urgency and environmental equity. So once again, vertically aligned with what the city of Boston is doing, they have these carbon neutral goals in 2050. And uh, we always want to do everything we do with a sense of urgency and environmental equity and, and, and diversity. Next slide. So, um, so the first component is the aggregator of best in class energy efficiency programs. We break up our programs into three different realms, residential, multifamily, commercial. Uh, so residential, HERS, BI, BPI training. I see Nancy's on the call today. So uh, we're getting those kicked off this month. Uh, multifamily, passive house, and then commercial, uh, BLC, uh, building operator certification and well and lead and G Pro. I, I see Melody's on the call today. So they've been these programs have been very good, and we we use these actually to a two prong effect to teach existing uh, industry. So some of the people who have been signing up for these classes are like Tufts University, Trinity Property Management, South Mountain, UMass, Johnson Controls, Fidelity, Boston Scientific, Northeastern University. Uh, Mass School Building Authority, all these, and the city of Boston. So we train all these people in these certification programs, and and we hope that they're gonna they're gonna be part of the center going forward with uh, continuing education. And we hope that they'll hire some of our uh, students coming out of the associate's degree program. So once again, our mission is we want agile, stackable degrees uh, that when you come, you get a certification, and maybe that certification is embedded in a uh, associate's degree program. And then after that, if you want, you can go on for a bachelor's. Next slide. So that's kind of, we went over this right. That's kind of what our programs uh, look like. And we've had about a hundred people go through these programs over the last year and a half. Next slide. We've mentioned this already. These are some of the people taking or signing up for our classes. Next slide. Um, so the design logic of the BAS portion, smart building technology is relatively new pathway in education, few programs in the country. And in fact, there were very few four-year programs in the country. The industry changes very fast. Curriculum must be agile and aligned with industry developments and standards, which are, which are still being developed. You know, BACnet's only 25 years old, Internet of Things 21 years old, Project Haystack six years old, ASHRAE guideline 30, 36 is two. These, these years are probably need to be tweaked by a year or so, et cetera. Cyber, cybersecurity concerns are a really big issue in our industries ever since the Target hack in 2014, where they, you know, they got everyone's credit card numbers because they got in through the HVAC system. So we have to deal with that. Next slide. And, you know, if you go, so there's a proprietary problem because if you, in the past, if you wanted to be trained in this sort of stuff, where do you go? And you have to go to the various uh, proprietary systems, Siemens, Automated Logic, Honeywell, you know, Johnson Controls. And often these programs aren't available to high outside people. They only offer them to their clients or, you know, their, their suppliers. And so there's very high barriers to entry. So we looked at all these programs and say, how can we, how can we get around this? Next, next slide, please. Uh, so we looked at all the programs. We looked at some of the terminology and the timeframes on how people train their, their people. And uh, certain things came up and certain sequences came up. And especially the terms like field, associate field technician and uh, field te technician practitioner, field technician associate. These terms were kind of common, uh, common things that the industry was using. Next slide. So we worked with, uh, there are other schools working on this, this wonderful organization, BEST, Building Efficiency for Sustainable Tomorrow. I see some people on the call from there. Uh, they got this great national, a huge National Science Foundation grant to kind of work on this. So um, how do we vertically and horizontally integrate non-proprietary software and hardware to kind of mimic uh, what people do in the field in a non-proprietary way yet give them enough knowledge where they can slide into the proprietary systems very easily. So we, uh, we weren't part of the initial grant, but they let us in and we learned a lot from these people. They helped our program a lot. We purchased some, uh, a lot, we, a whole new training program based on some of their outcomes and developments. We 
we started a new lab based on some of that uh, kind of feedback and outcomes they got from that grant. Next slide. So we came up with this uh, this theory that we want to in the BAS training we want to run like uh, three main uh, kind of tranches of certification: certified BAS technician associate, which is the BAS fundamentals and intro intro to BAS software, BAS control devices, and BAS networking class. Uh, a certified BAS practitioner class, which is advanced electrical, advanced HVAC, logic and programming, and BAS system design. And then finally, a certified BAS technician, which need all the previous two, which, which goes into great depth into BAS integration and an internship. Next slide. So, uh, you know, we want, this is how these programs, these standalone certification programs uh, stack up in the middle, one, two, three, they're all about 111 hours. Actually, we have to increase some of the hours. We've been beta testing these with the, with industry over the last year. We're through like the first two tranches of it. And uh, we found that we have to up the hours a little bit, but um, the, the theory for us is we want to take like the first module, the number one, and insert it in the associate's degree program. So that's gonna kick off in the fall uh, since we had delays with that, with uh, COVID and everything. And, but that's kicking off in the fall. And you know, with these, sort of, these um, certification programs that are embedded in the associate's degree, we wanna leverage best in class information from our other partners. For instance, we leverage a lot from the BLC, the Smart Building Technology book that came out you know, in the last year or so, that's kind of new. We, you know, we use uh, EZIO controllers, which was just, it was a non-proprietary controller that, which I'll talk about in a second, but they were just purchased by Johnson Controls. So we use those controllers. Um, a lot of the best stuff we, equipment that we bought and how, how students wire the equipment and use the software with the equipment that came out of that National Science Foundation grant. And then for our networking thing, we leverage CompTIA Network Plus, Next slide, I'm gonna to have to pick up the pace. So basically this is kind of like the kits work on, look like they have the software, they plug it into a controller, input and output devices, next slide. And it's, you know, we use Sedona software, which is very similar to Honeywell's Tritium Niagara, one of the big players in the industry. It looks exactly the same, but the Sedona is free and it's open source, next slide. And it has all the bells and whistles, you know, all the fans spinning and the graphics, next slide. So that's kind of how that program works. Next slide. We have all these lab exercises that we worked on, some over 80 lab exercises with the equipment. Next slide. This is what our lab looks like now. We have three series of kits on the left, yellow, black, and a bigger black, where students work through exercises They actually have to wire the controllers and, and all the input and output devices and plug their laptops in. And then on the right, we have a full-blown air handling unit that they can use with other controllers. Next slide. And that's kind of what they look like, uh, our trainers. This is you know over a million dollar lab that we built. Next slide. Uh, stakeholder engagement. This is kind of that map we're working on of the ecosystem. We always want to know what, you know, we're, we feel like we're really embedded in Boston's ecosystem now. Um, and we always want, we always hold events like the climate change conference for the city of Boston at our school and the Senator Markey launched the Civilian Climate Corps. And we always want to engage uh, our stakeholders and uh, socially, economically, and environmentally. Next slide. And that's pretty much it. We had a very interesting year and a half where, where and it'll be more interesting in the fall because we'll be 100% up and running in the fall. Our, the last phase of our lab just got completed and we got a lot of feedback by running 100 people through the program and, and beta testing all our, our classes and stuff. So it's going to be a very exciting fall, and hopefully we can be a uh, you know a resource for the country going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And obviously your uh, email is here as well. But if folks have specific uh, questions about uh, either for you or about you know. Who are some graduates maybe coming out of Roxbury Community College's program that they should talk to? Uh, should they reach out to you or, or what's the best way to follow up? Yep, you can just reach out to me. Awesome. 
Great. Well, thank you for our fantastic speakers. And we have plenty of time for Q&A. You'll see on this slide a reminder at the very bottom to uh, submit questions at slido.com with the event code DOE. And then there should be a list where you can select the Workforce Accelerator Meetup. We do have questions that have been coming in there, so we will start with those. But if anybody uh, has not had the chance yet to submit questions, now is the time to get in there. Also note that you can also upvote questions. Um, so if you're feeling shy, <laughs> you can also just upvote ones that you think we should address, and those will kind of rise to the top here, so to speak. Um, so a bunch of questions have come in. Uh, it looks like the one on the screen is slightly more updated even than, than on my phone, so that's cool. Um, but, uh, you know, just some questions that I think maybe everybody can chime in on. Uh, one person asked, you know, really more of a statement about how we're looking to provide enduring, well-paid, purposeful careers that uh, many positions in the service economy are currently unable to provide as a living wage. And so um, using that kind of as a premise, um, I'm curious for really any of our speakers, what you guys think are kind of the most um, compelling reasons to the young people that you guys work with in particular to get involved in this industry? What do you think um, is exciting people to go through the hard work of getting trained up and um, being in these programs? And any of you could start. Okay, so maybe I'll start since I'm, I'm still um, oiled up from speaking. Um, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a problem because in our neighbor, you know, how do I get students, like, it's very comp complicated to kind of, uh, if I go to like a career fair or as you say, community meeting, how do I get students excited about this, this field? Because there's, it's a brand new profession and it's growing tremendously and there's not enough workers. And so it's going to be a long ride if you get in. So how do you get students kind of, um, excited about this. We have a lot of talks about this. And in fact, we even started like a drone piloting class, training class from the FAA, because in Boston to operate a drone, you need a license. And at least I could bring that to get people to the table. <laughs> so they see that. So I need sexy things like that to kind of get students init initiated into the conversation. But also, uh, I get a lot, a lot of the contractors in our neighborhood in Roxbury, they come to me and say, I hear so much about this stuff. But quite frankly, I have no idea where to start. So we've been working really hard on the granularity of, of what we're doing and compressing it into small as possible. How do we explain the opportunities? And that's part of what I was talking about in terms of the ecosystem map. Where's the money coming from? What's happening career-wise? What are the career paths? And what's the opportunity to you? Like, And where do you go to get more information? And how do you map out where you're going in this career? So we try to make it very simple and and kind of, you know, it's gotta be at a level of granularity that can be portable and, and people can take after you tell them they can take to their communities, right? So that's a big thing. Absolutely. Mary Ellen, you just came on. <laughs> so um, I, I think that um, uh, paying trainees, core members or where wherever they are um, in their journey, uh, a living wage is is critical, um, but m more so than that, even I think it's important that programs are able to demonstrate the long term benefit to the young people, the career pathways, the opportunities for advancement, the um, salary increases that are available, the enjoyability of the work, um, and and also that trainers are able to, if not guarantee a job after the training um, ends, be able to make connections with employers and industry representatives. Um, so it's got to be, we, we have to do a better job of making it relevant and worthwhile to the participants, both while they are in the program and um, when they complete. Also making, showing examples of people that look like them that have succeeded. That's very important. Yeah. Great point. 
Uh, Adele, I don't know if there's anything you want to chime in on this one. No, I think What's they the value proposition. Is? I think they cover it. Okay, great. Well. Perfect. Um, now, uh, a question that's kind of been upvoted the most number of times now, it looks like, is uh, do you do retraining for structural unemployment issues among established workers? Um, so I, I don't know what specific structural unemployment issues this question asker is referring to, but um, maybe Adele, you might have uh, be able to chime in here first. Curious your thoughts. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and one we're addressing, you know, as we speak, we are trying to figure out how we can support um, fossil fuel power plant workers as they're transitioning. We just had Indian Point close here in New York State. You know, some workers retired, some are looking for new employment. In some cases, there might be good um, transferable skills to the offshore wind industry, for example, uh, to large scale renewable projects. In some of our uh, initial data analysis, working with our New York State Department of Labor, a lot of those individuals in the power plant industry, for example, is a good number of truck drivers. So obviously they could work in other industries. So we're looking at the training opportunities. We're looking at the training needs. We have to be flexible. We wanna train them before they leave. You know, we wanna provide training in the evening so they can do that while they're still working. So we're still doing a lot of the analysis and as part of our climate action council work, in our Just Transition Working Group, we are trying to get a real good grip on those um, transitioning workers that will need support. So a lot more to come in New York. Absolutely. Uh, Mariano, Frank, I don't know if you wanna chime in on this one. I know you guys are working with folks a little bit earlier in their career typically. Yeah, I think a big opportunity is probably hydrogen. You know, because not too many people are talking about it. It's only people in California who are talking about it. And but I think it, when once we get away from the electrification of all the vehicles, I think the trucks are going to be a harder thing to electrify. So things like hydrogen and hybrid things like that need to come into play. So um, I think that's probably a next wave in a, in a very natural transition from gasoline to hydrogen, right? Kind of fuel and stations. So yeah, cool. Um, I know, you know, uh, maybe a different frame on this particular question, but um, as, as folks on the line are aware, I do quite a bit of my work uh, on, on workforce development, kind of the supply and pipeline issues around getting a workforce that's prepared to fill these jobs that are, are even currently available. But um, when I, I look at this one, I think about some of DOE's work to really focus on um, increasing the market and uh, really market growth and scalability of building efficiency. And, you know, um, I also manage the home energy score program for the residential buildings team, um, which is focused on, let's make sure consumers have access to information so that, um, you know, more homeowners are and landlords are aware of energy efficiency savings opportunities so that there's a more steady stream of business. I know in at least the residential space, there's often issues of, Kind of seasonal patterns to work um and so you know trying to think about ways that uh, at doe at least even if it's kind of separate from our workforce portfolio um that we're focused on su really supporting a strong market demand for energy uh efficiency and flexibility in buildings overall cool. um looks like the next couple ones uh are tagged for mary ellen uh in terms of the the up of voting. Um, uh, I think the first one is about uh, some of the barriers that you mentioned um, for employment um, that maybe uh, young people are currently seeing and what are ways that the court can help address those things? Sure. Um, so certain um, populations, particularly um, young people from low income communities, that have suffered from years of, of disinvestment um, may not have, um, have had the opportunity to complete high school or have held jobs. Um, they might have a criminal record. They might not have um, transportation to get to a job. They might have childcare needs. So um, young people, particularly in, in low income communities, are more likely to face multiple barriers to em employment. Jobs might be um, not located 
in their communities. So the core network can help uh, manage uh, the cores. Our programs have staff on hand that can help manage some of those issues. A lot of cores have caseworkers that can connect young people to the appropriate um, support services, maybe food stamps, housing assistance. Um, some cores can provide bus passes or expungement services. So um, I think meeting the young people where they are is really important and being able to provide them the support they need to both get into and through the program. And cores, after many decades of experience, most of them have, um, have figured out how to do this pretty well. Um, so that um, there, there are all kinds of barriers to employment. I mean, right now, um, I, and I think the taking a job in a training program or, or a first job where you can't make, your end, make ends meet from the salary um, is an issue. Um, when starting a core, um, no, no one is required to join the core network. Um, we do offer a number of um, services and products and resources for communities that are interested in starting a core. We have a starting a core manual. We have best practices. Um, we have a training and technical assistance team that can help with feasibility studies, but no core, mem um, core network membership is, is not, not required. Um, we do have um, a, a dues um, schedule and we have a new and emerging category that, um, that is very reasonable and we very often work with communities and organizations where that might be an issue. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you for jumping into that next question. I was curious about that one too. I was like, oh, some, some folks on the line thinking about what it would mean to join the core network. So. Um, that's great. I know the next question is also, it, it talks about the core uh, core specifically, but I, I, I will amend it myself to uh, be broader than, than even just the course. I'm curious for Adele and Frank to chime in here too. Um, but curious about um, if you guys have any uh, data that talks about, or, or have you done your own internal evaluations around where do people go next after they participate in your programs? And I'll say, um, if you, you know, are still working on it, that's okay. I know we have an active project going on right now for uh, the Department of Energy Solar Decathlon to better understand, okay, we've been doing this for a bunch of years. Where, where are they now? Um, but curious if folks online have uh, done that already. Hi, this is Adele. I'll jump in. And I think this is also related to a question below this. Uh, if it's a training program at NYSERDA that we fund for new workers, we actually do, as I mentioned, we look for the business partnerships that are going to interview. We do ask those training providers to track those individuals for a year. They have to track them for a year. So we do have a good sense of where they're placed and if they last a year. If it's our on-the-job training program where we're helping a business hire a new worker, so we're working directly with the business, in our partnership with the New York State Department of Labor, they do track the worker for a year as well. So we have two mechanisms, different mechanisms, different programs to track trainees or new hires for 12 months. It's hard, you know, they, they leave, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a, good, it's a good attempt and we get some pretty good data. Um, I, I would just echo, um... It, it is a, a hard thing to nail down, um, and it's a um, the the population at least that goes to cores. Young people, sixteen to twenty five, tend to be very mobile, um, hard to kind of keep track of. Some cores have um, the resources to have staff on that can just continue to be a resource to the young person, um, and and help them make the transition to to the next job and maybe even the next job after that. So it kind of depends on the, the size and capacity of each individual core program. Some of them have Department of Labor grants or state grants that allow them to put um, quite a bit of resource into, into post-program um, placement support and tracking. The majority probably do not, um, but we, they, we kind of try our best across the network. Um, but to, to Adele's point, having partnerships with employees and 
employers, I, I should say, and industry partners is, um, is really critical to uh, positive post-program placement retention. Yeah, we have more, uh, it's Frank, we have more requests for people that we, than we can supply, totally. And as you know, any grant that you deal with, the requirements are very strict nowadays where they wanna know where, you're, where they're going and how you're getting them jobs and internships. And you have to get people work, you know, at least over 60, 50% of the, the people you, you train. So there, there are many requirements to any sort of grant these days that make us kind of track that. But the demand for people that we're kicking out is just so tremendous. We, we're still not at a place that we need to be where we're training enough people. So that's our big nut to crack over the next year. How do we scale things up? Yeah, good reminder of the challenges at play. I know, um, you know, oftentimes there's, I think there are often examples of um, training programs that uh, unfortunately train people for jobs that don't exist. Um, in, in a specific location or a certain skill set. Um, and so I, I know that often worries people and, and is an unfortunate um, thing that can happen. But I also know that in much of the building efficiency space, there is no shortage of work to be done. Um, and it, it, a lot of it does have to do with kind of connecting to people who are ready to hire, um, you know, particularly maybe in May when, when students are graduating from programs or, or whenever kind of the program ends. Um, so it's a good point. Um, one thing that I've just been thinking about, um, uh, you know, as, as all of you have spoken, I know, um, you know, many of your organizations and work have done a great job of, of reaching um, young people of color. You've, you've shown that in, in the metrics that have been shown on the slides or described. Um, I also spend quite a bit of time, you know, talking to folks maybe at more the trade association level or, or elsewhere that are saying, you know, we really want to have, bring in more diversity, but, you know, we're finding it really hard. <laughs> we don't know where to find people. And so clearly you guys have had some more success in, in this space, at least getting folks into training programs. And I'm curious if you had advice for people about how they can maybe uh, do more to uh, foster uh, inclusion in in the energy efficiency sector, what you'd recommend? So, I mean, for us, this is why people come to us because there's such a demand to do that. And as I said before, we can't keep up with the demand. Um, so when you look at the, the field, it's mostly, uh, you know, the places where these people are going is mostly 55 or older white males in it. And we find it a challenge in a lot of, a lot of our uh, classes to uh, kind of keep people in the program, especially people of color or females who can't relate to the content on the initial goal, goals, an initial goal of the program. So we make an extreme effort to kind of uh, keep those people in the program because we tell them that the industry is demanding so much more diversity and we can't supply it. So the opportunities will be amplified if you're in one of these minority uh, sectors. So that's just a way of us selling the program. And I mean, quite frankly, that's where most of it, people come to us because they want that and they need that and they need to prove that they're doing that right now. Um, the, the core network um, actually has a partnership with the Kellogg Foundation and we have for about five years now. Did, um, uh, something called the Moving Forward Initiative, which is designed to um, improve um, the prospects of young people of, of color in conservation and natural resource careers. And so we've developed um, some resources and trainings, um, both targeted or intended for the core members to help them identify and address um, structural racism and unconscious bias um, and, and overcome um, some of the historical oppression that exists in their communities um, to help them navigate some of that, but also some trainings for employers to help them um, do equity audits and cultural competency assessments of their own workplace and their hiring practices and policies. Um, so there are definitely ways, um, th there's work to be done on, on all sides, both support of 
the incoming uh, workers and the employers. One thing I'd like to add, so we have a project that focuses on providing training support and career pathway training to individuals from public housing authorities. So we're working within low income housing to recruit individuals and train them and actually give them internships within the housing authority and potential jobs with contractors afterwards. So that's one exciting opportunity. And I mentioned a few times our partnership with the New York State Department of Labor they help us find targeted populations. In our on-the-job training program, we provide a higher wage subsidy if businesses hire priority populations, and DOL helps us do that. And we've done that through job fairs, for example, where DOL will do targeted uh, outreach to low-income individuals to bring them to the job fairs. We have a higher incentive if companies hire them. So we're always looking for creative ways to, to find priority populations to make those matches and we provide additional incentives to, to make that all happen. Awesome. And uh, Adele, I guess sticking with you, you can see the two remaining questions from, from folks are, are more directed at you. The first one we maybe have already addressed a little bit in, in one of the previous ones, but um, folks also wanna know where, where the money's coming from. <laughs> yeah, just related to the first question, I know we touched upon it a little bit, I did. Also in our projects, we provide funding for tracking and, and providing metrics reporting. So we know it's a challenge. We, we do that for a year and we fund those activities. I just wanted to mention that. Almost all of the funding for our workforce development and training program, I think it's all of it right now, is state funding. I mentioned potential federal funding from CIPRA based on outcomes, but that's only based on outcomes. Our full $108 million comes from ratepayers. It's an assessment on their electric bills. Um, in our projects that we're developing training, infrastructure or capacity, there is a cost share requirement. It's 10% for career pathways. It could be labor. It could be third party uh, support from manufacturers. It could be equipment donations and 30% for more traditional training. So we do see private cost share uh, for many of our projects. Great, thank you. Um, I'll also note, I see one uh, comment that's come in uh, that says one proven way to attract learners of young learners of color is to create a recruitment network consisting of community-based organizations. And I just wanted to, to echo that sentiment. I know sometimes when folks feel like, oh, I'm not, you know, my organization isn't currently reaching people, I'll create one <laughs> that does that. And, and oftentimes that's actually just replicating work that um, you know, organizations uh, within communities of color have already done. Um, and so what are ways that folks can partner with other organizations um, to leverage the resources and, and connections that already exist? Um, I don't know if folks have anything to add on there, or if there's, if there's a great local partner any of you uh, work with in this space. Oh, Mary Ellen, you are muted. Sorry. I, I would just say for the most part, service and conservation corps are community-based organizations. They are located in the communities. Um, most of the core members come to the core because of a, a word of mouth. They know other folks who have been through it. And the, the cores have those partnerships um, with, um, with local organizations, boys and girls clubs, churches. And, um, and, and so uh, for if, if you're having trouble with re recruiting, a, a good first step might be to see if there is a core operating in your community that might already have those, those ties. Yeah, we're working with a lot of community-based organizations to do the training. But in some cases where, for example, a community college might be the lead, they've partnered with those community-based organizations for recruiting, for outreach, for screening, so that we see them as being a really important partner in all of our career pathway projects at a minimum. Yeah, our stakeholders are the community and there's so many uh, organizations that are in our community that we, it's really a challenge keeping up with all of them, but uh, we always, we have a responsibility to do so because that's part of our mission to be in alignment with our community. So we go, we do roadshows all the time and, and try to work with them on recruiting students and finding jobs, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, 
I, I see there's a emphasis. We should not duplicate work. Sharing is a good thing. Love that. Um, one last question before we'll do a couple of wrap up items. Um, someone has asked if the focus can be placed on selecting and working with employers who will actually hire the employee upon graduation from a program. And curious um, if any of you have uh, examples of when maybe that those partnerships have worked really well, or if there's been some challenges to making those work. Do you know, are there moments where you find an employer that says, oh, we're not going to hire them because of some pre-existing, you know, I, I, I know sometimes something on, on somebody's record can be um, really limiting, um, but advice for companies perhaps in working with you all. So in our, in our career pathway training projects, where we require those training providers to have a relationship with businesses that will hire or to demonstrate business demand, we of course can't require the business to hire because there are so many other factors, but we can have as a requirement that the businesses interview. So as you know, there are a lot of other challenges, but I think the question also gets at, we are directly supporting employers in our on the job training program. It's an employer comes to us and says, I want to hire someone. And uh, it could be as an intern, we provide 90, up to 90% of an intern's wage. And in on the job training, it could be up to 75% of a wage for six months. So those incentives combined could be 15, $16,000. And it's all directly related to hiring either as an intern or a new hire. But as you noted, there are challenges in the past, we had job retention rates for on-the-job training of 75, 80%, which was really good. With COVID, of course, you know, all bets are off. We've seen some tremendous losses. We've seen some of those workers picked up. We provide additional uh, flexibility in the program, but a lot of challenges faced by these employers looking to hire new workers. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, all the speakers and also attendees for your active engagement, asking questions and things. We have a couple housekeeping items to wrap up that we'll just go through. So first, I think is, uh, yes, our additional resources slide. So we have a web page for our Better Building Workforce Accelerator, where you can see a list of all of our partners, a fact sheet, um, and a uh, link to our blog posts that we put out about um, all of the presentations that we do. Um, you can also see on the Better Building Solutions Center, our workforce development portal, which has plenty of information and resources, some that these organizations have put together and others, um, just as kind of a hub for careers in this space. Uh, next slide. Uh, we will, uh, also have our summer webinar series. So we'd like to invite you to attend. Um, these are starting in June where partners will discuss some of the most pressing topics that are being faced, uh, share best practices and innovative new approaches. Um, if you go to the Better Building Solutions Center and click on events and webinars, you should be able to find these. Uh, next slide. If you have additional questions, here is all of our emails and contact information for the Better Buildings team as well, all included here. Uh, we are happy to follow up with you and always excited to learn more about pro other programs that are going on and how we can support. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for taking time to be with us today. Um, we've also launched a short feedback survey within Slido so that you can uh, take a couple minutes to give us feedback on this session and how we can improve in the future. Um, your answers will be visible to other attendees um, and you can provide feedback as well on uh, other sessions uh, or sorry, other features of the summit, including uh, our content, webinars, et cetera. Um, and feel free to reach out to any of us about the Solution Center content as well. Um, I'm not sure if was there time is there time to do the video or not enough time. <laughs> not sure if that was supposed to pop up at some point, but that's okay. I'm sure other sessions will show you the video. <laughs> cool. And with that, uh, I think we can end the session. Thanks all for your time and attention.